Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to the Nasagni Law Firm's webinar on the new Gatsby rules for pensions, what labor leaders need to know. My name is David E. Nasagni. To my left is one of our senior labor attorneys, Jack Edwards, and to my right is Shailene Nasagni, who is our in-house CPA. I'll have them both introduce themselves momentarily. I'd like to take just a moment to tell you about our law firm. We are a public safety uh, labor law firm that was founded about 40 years ago by my father with a focus on providing comprehensive representation for our clients, uh, not only at the negotiations table, but through politics, through discipline, through labor representation, complex litigation, uh, as well as workers' compensation and personal injury, which are all departments within our firm. Uh, with what has been going on recently, we've all seen it in the newspaper in terms of pension reform, the attack on public employee pensions and compensations. Uh, we figured that this was a timely topic and it was an important issue for our clients to make themselves versed in because these Gatsby rules, as we learned when Gatsby 45 came out, which dealt with other post-employment benefits, specifically retiree medical benefits, that information can be used for improper purposes. So our hope today is to give you as labor leaders the information that you need in order to be able to counteract misinformation and understand what's going on with your comprehensive annual financial statements and at the bargaining table. With that, I will turn it over to Jeff Edwards. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jeff Edwards. I'm an attorney in the labor department here at the firm. Uh, I do a lot of litigation. I've been litigating pension issues for a couple of years. You know, this pension reform stuff started in the cities and counties about three or four years ago. There were some cities and counties that went out on their own, did their own thing, and involved in that kind of litigation in the Central Coast and in Southern California, as well as advising clients about pension obligations and negotiating for pensions in light of the changes in the law over the past few years. So this has been an issue that's really been on the front burner. I think everyone knows that uh, the governor signed pension reform in September. Uh, hopefully that's uh, close to the last chapter of this uh, topic on the front burner, but um, it's certainly going to be an issue for the next couple of years as that gets implemented. And one of the big pieces of the puzzle is GASB 68 and um, these accounting rules that are going to change how things look on paper. So we want to talk about that today demystify that piece of the puzzle to level the playing field between these managers and uh, labor. Shailene, can you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Shailene Osadmi. I'm a certified public accountant and I work in-house for the Saturday Law Firm. Um, I've worked for about seven to eight years at another county firm doing a lot of the same stuff, doing forensic accounting, um, looking at cities and counties, financial statements, and really trying to understand those for our labor clients, and it just makes sense this past year to come in help and be able to offer that service for our clients here. Um, so hopefully today we'll be able to really get into the, the nuts and bolts of Gazoo 68 and help everyone understand that and make it so it's not so confusing. And one thing Shailene didn't mention is she's the brains behind this operation. You know, we, we understand it, we litigate it, we negotiate it, um, but she understands everything that's moving under the hood, and it's a real asset to our firm and our practice to have someone so sophisticated uh, to bring this information directly to our clients. We believe it's critical to have somebody who understands the accounting lingo and understands the accounting practices so that when you're at the bargaining table and the chief financial officer starts spewing numbers and data, you have someone who understands that and as Jeff said, can demystify it and separate you know, fact from fiction, separate what is a reporting requirement and what is actually a funding requirement. And I know that even in today's economic times, it's become such a more important issue of really understanding the numbers, understanding the accounting behind them, because it's not a matter of, you know, there's excess money, I mean, now it's a matter of what's there, what can we have, what do we really need to be paying. Um, so I, 
it's something that's really important this time. So with that, let's go to our first slide. Make it a slide up there. All right. So the issues that we're going to be covering today um, in the big picture sense are first, what is GASB 68? Next is a tutorial on how pension accounting works in layman's terms. Challenges that you as labor leaders can expect to face at the table in light of these new accounting rules. Understanding net pension liability and uh, finally understanding what is uh, the buzzword pension exposure. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about what GASB 68 is. And it's important to start um, with the discussion of what GASB itself is. So uh, GASB is the um, GASB is the Government Accounting Standards Board. It's not part of the government. It's an independent organization, but it sets these standards. And they're standards that most people follow. The standards are not the law. There's no legal requirement to follow them. But most people do, and the reason they do is because if you don't follow these standards they put out as a government or as a corporation or as whatever, it affects what other people think about your finances. It's really how you get to transparency on the finances. You get an independent auditor or CPA to certify that you're following these generally accepted accounting principles. And so GASB is the source of generally accepted accounting principles that are used by state and local governments. As with most entities involved in creating these generally accepted accounting principles in the U.S., it's a non-profit, non-governmental organization. Uh, GASB is subject to oversight by a group called the Financial Accounting Foundation, which selects the members of GASB, and um, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. It also funds both organizations. The mission of the government Accounting Standards Board is to establish and improve standards of state and local government accounting and financial reporting that will result in useful information to users of their financial reports or CAFRs and guide and educate the public, including people who issue debt like bond, bonds or um, other types of loans to public entities and use those financial reports. And that includes us and labor on um, in government employment because we want to take advantage of those financial reports to understand what's really going on under the hood. So GASB uses a lot of different words to describe the stuff it puts out, um, statements, interpretations, technical bulletins, and standards. And what we're going to be talking about today is GASB 68, which is one of those quote unquote standards um, that is supposed to be used across the field. But you know, the big stuff about GASB, it's not part of the government, it's not the law, it makes recommendations, but most people follow them because, you know, any city or county that's going to want to borrow money from a bank for any project, the first thing that bank's going to ask is, are you certified as following uh, generally accepted accounting principles? So that we can look at your books and know what this means and it means stuff to us and to our, you know, uh, accountants so that we can figure out if this is a good deal for us. And so most places are going to follow these rules. Um, they've been putting out these rules for local and government agencies since about 1984. The important thing to remember, as Jeff said, they're guidelines. They don't have the force of law, but they do affect bond ratings, and so most local governments are going to follow them or try to follow them. So, like I mentioned, they put out these quote unquote standards, and these standards have numbers, so it's like an easy reference guide. The new one is GASB 68. Um, but GASB 68 comes out with GASB 67, which is really for pension plans, so like for CalPERS or for your 1937 Act, and that's about stuff that they have to do in their internal accounting. Um, GASB 68 is about what a government employer has to do in accounting for pensions and what it has to pay for pensions. We're going to talk about GASB 68 today because that's what's going to affect you at the bargaining table. Uh, GASB 68 goes into effect June 15, 2014, essentially fiscal year 2015, um, but we're expecting that most government employers can start moving towards the GASB 68 standards sooner rather than later. And they're going to be getting pressure 
from all sides to be doing that. You've got, you know, the League of Cities, the California Association of Counties, they're communicating about this stuff to their members, but also those lenders. Um, you know, if somebody wants to take out a loan, one of the things that's going to happen when they start evaluating the city or the county is saying, okay, are you following GASB 68 yet? So, you know, you can expect that these things are going to start moving pretty quickly. People are going to start adopting them. It goes into effect in 2014. Um, GASB says that the reason it adopted this new rule was to increase transparency, consistency, and comparability of pension information across governments. The truth is that different pension systems in different states use different systems for accounting for how much that's going to cost, and different employers use different systems. And that's made it challenging for um, big banks and other organizations to look under the hood and see exactly how much this is going to cost, how much money this city or county has when they're making those lending decisions. So a lot of pressure has been building for a long time to have a kind of universal, easy to compare standard. And that's part of what's going on here. Um, that's what they're trying to do. I think a lot of people think that it's just going to create more confusion in an area that's already confusing. Because as we're going to discuss in a little bit, it doesn't actually change how much anything costs. It just creates a new system for putting it on paper that's really parallel to reality and doesn't cross paths with it. Um, so, you know, with highly sophisticated organizations, I think they're going to be okay, and a lot of people are going to understand that difference when you're sophisticated on both sides. Um, but you can see a lot of places where with, you know, new difficult accounting rules, a smaller city or county that isn't as sophisticated won't really understand its obligations, or just the converse, um, a labor organization that um, isn't able to have a sophisticated approach to bargaining and it's just taking the information they're given by their employer isn't going to understand what's happened to them. Um, so, you know, that's a big part of what we're trying to overcome today, at least on the labor side, but um, a lot of people are, have been critical of the new GASB standards as just too cerebral and too complicated uh, for practical use in local and county governments. So, as 68, um, makes just a ton of changes. And Shailene, do you have a copy of it there? Can you yeah. hold up just how big GASB 68 is? It, it makes it, you think for a second we talk about GASB 68, it'd be like, you know, two points on a page or something, but it's essentially a book that people have to read and study. It's like a new textbook. Um, so here's just kind of really, really big picture, some changes that it makes from the way things used to be. Um, there are two pieces to pension calculation. One is the liability and one is the expense. We'll talk more about those in the slides that follow. Um, the first issue here, net pension liability recorded on financial statements as a liability. All right, so before this GASB 68 thing came out, um, the liability for the pension was never recorded on the financial statement. The only thing that was recorded was the expense, like how much is this going to cost right now, okay? Because that's what really matters on a, on a balance sheet, right? Um, so the big change in this area is that now they have to report the total liability. And then there are all these rules for how they calculate that too. Um, now they have to report the full net pension liability on the balance sheet, which is going to make the local governments look like they're severely underfunded and overloaded with debt. Because if you compare the, the new balance sheet to last year's balance sheet, all of a sudden this giant number is going to appear on it that wasn't there before. And it's going to look like something big has changed. And actually nothing has changed. And people who know what they're doing with this stuff know that it's really GASB 68 that's making them change the statement, not like anything really happened with the money. Second, uh, different assumptions are used to calculate net pension liability. So how net pension liability is to be calculated is significantly different from how most agencies calculate it, especially CalPERS. CalPERS has its own system that's been doing it for years about how it calculates how much it's going to cost to pay off those pension benefits. And then it has full investment side, it makes assumptions, um, and it all boils down to an amount that they charge the employers. And that's been working for a long time. Well, this sets up different rules that are different than CalPERS rules, different than your 1937 Act rules, different than the rules they do in Illinois or the rules they do in Florida. Um, and so this system is going to create like, a parallel um, with new definitions in that pension liability. The third major change from with GASB 68 is changes to how pension expense is calculated. 
It changes how the pension expense to be reported is calculated. It's very important that this is different when, than what the actual pension expense paid is. So you're going to hear this over and over again. It's going to sound like a mantra, but this is the biggest thing we want to get across in this presentation. Pension cost, pension liability reported is different than what's actually paid. Reported and paid are going to be different from now on. Um, and then the fourth major change uh, from GASB 68 is changes the information required to be disclosed in the notes of those financial statements. Now, if you read one of these financial statements, so how many pages of these financial statements did they put out? A hundred. Okay. So most people aren't reading the notes, but she's reading the notes, right? Um, and we're reading the notes to analyze what's really going on under the hood, what a <coughs> certified public accountant has reported is going on. You, you'd be surprised how often um, you know, people in city management have kind of just a big picture sense of their finances. You know, they understand what's going on, but they don't really understand what note 74 on a 100 page report means. Well, one of the things that GASB 68 is changing is what you put in those notes. And it adds a lot of new information disclosures that will have to be included in the notes in the back of those financial statements. And so, you know, if you're bargaining, you want to be working with a team that, like, gets what those notes mean, so you can say, how sure are we that, you know, you really have, you're looking at a 10% loss in revenue next year and you need concessions. You've got to be able to analyze those notes and dig into that packet. And it's not going to make any sense to somebody what those notes mean anymore if you don't understand the way Gatsby has changed them. Because you're going to look at the notes from last year, the notes for, you know, the year after they implement Gatsby 68, they're going to be really different and you've got to understand why. So that's one of the big changes to Gatsby 68 is causing. Um, to put this in a little bit of perspective, um, David's going to talk a little bit about how pension accounting works. So let's talk about net um, pension liability. This is what has to be reported on your financial statements. Uh, what that means is on your cap work and comprehensive annual financial statements, as I had mentioned before. So how do we determine what the net pension liability is? As you can see from the slide, the, you first take the total pension liability, which is the present obligation of earned deferred benefits. So basically, in layman's terms, what that means is what your agency has to pay in the future. You next determine what the plan net position is. This is the pension net assets available for paying benefits. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, essentially, what you have to set aside, which you've already set aside, in order to pay those benefits. You subtract the net uh, plan position from the total pension liability, and you're left with the net pension liability, which is essentially the amount that is not pre-funded, or as the local governments like to describe it, the unfunded liability in relation to your pension. So getting kind of to the, the big picture stuff that we want to get across, we want to talk about what this is all going to mean at the table, because I think that's what people really care about, right? Um, so we want to talk about some of the challenges at the table, and then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, exactly the mechanics of how it all works. So we did a little introduction on GASB. <laughs> they gave a little background on just, you know, how the arithmetic works at the very top of the formula um, to give some background going through it. And now we want to talk about the challenges at the table. Um, Shailene, can you talk a little bit about reported versus funded and what that means at the table? Right. So this, as Jeff said earlier, this is the most important thing. But if you guys walk away with nothing else today, it's what we want you to understand. Um, so if you have questions on these topics, please send them in and hopefully we can get everything up. So, um, basically, what GASB 68 is doing is it's coming out, it's changing how you're calculating your pension liability and your pension expense. And it is a different calculation than how CalPERS and the other pension agency have calculated it and most likely will continue to calculate it. So at the end of the day, the number that's recorded on your financial statement is different than the amount that you are actually required or and or actually paid into your pension plan. Those amounts are different. They're not going to be the same. 
The only way that the amounts will be the same is that if the city or county local government makes the policy decision to pay in the higher gas fee amount. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But the bottom line is that is very clear that they say to themselves. Gadgety rules are for reporting purposes only. They have nothing to do with how much you need to pay for your pension benefits and with how much you actually do pay for your pension benefits. It has nothing to do with how Gadgety is required to calculate the liability for the pension benefits. To follow up a little bit on that, as uh, many of you I'm sure remember when Gadgety 45 came out and required that the financial statements report the unfunded liability. Uh, in relation primarily to retiree medical benefits, that created quite a stir and a lot of folks were misconstruing those reporting requirements as a pre-funding requirement. And as Shailene said, it's very clear there's a difference between what has to be reported and what has to actually be paid. The, uh, the Gatsby Commission came out themselves and said they recognized the confusion caused by Gatsby 45 and they said, you know, although this deals with pension as opposed to other post-employment benefits, that they were concerned that that same confusion would occur and they've been very clear that these are reporting requirements only. There is no obligation to pre-fund in any of the amounts that have to be reported. So it used to be really easy to figure out how much your agency was going to pay for the last of CalPERS pension or the 1937 Act pension. Because CalPERS or the 1937 agency would tell them. And they'd tell them this is how much you have to pay this year. We ran the numbers. This is the adjustable employer contribution. Um, now what's happening with GASB is you still got all that going on, just the same. But they're creating new rules that the county has to calculate and put on, on paper. But they don't have to pay it. And so I think that the big challenge at the table is going to be you have two types of employers. Okay, you have maybe smaller ones who are unsophisticated and they don't get it. They don't get that they just have to calculate it. They don't have to pay it. Okay, um, and so they tell you, oh, we have to pay it, and they don't. They don't get it. Um, but then you're going to have more sophisticated employers um, who are going to tell you that they have to pay it and try to convince you that they have to pay it, even though they know they don't really have to pay it. Um, and those are the ones to watch out for. So, you know, how to approach that problem at the table is going to be different every time, but we want you to at least be able to spot the problem. And the way you spot the problem is you ask them, um, are these the reported numbers for GASB 68, or are these the numbers you're actually paying for the pension? And um, those will be different things. So you get an unsophisticated employer, they're going to have no idea what you're talking about. That. You know, you're going to have to unpack this a little bit with them. And you might be able to get to a place where they realize, oh, gee, we don't have to pay as much as we think we do. So glad we figured that out. Um, but then you're going to have other ones where they're going to give you those numbers. It's going to be more clear to you that they understand the difference. And then what you're really trying to figure out is what their policy decision is. Have they made a decision to give CalPERS the money CalPERS is asking for? Or have they for some reason decided they're going to give CalPERS more than what CalPERS is asking for? I think a lot of agencies are going to be reluctant to give CalPERS more, but they still may be trying to get concessions out of you off of this quote unquote reported amount under these new GASB rules. Um, so let's look a little bit more about what GASB has to say about the difference. And these are potent weapons to use at the bargaining table to help explain to management or expose management about the difference between these two things. Okay, so there's kind of just more quotes here that were taken out of um, GASB articles. And so we'll just get a walk through them really quick one by one. Uh, the new statements relate to accounting and financial reporting issues only. How pension costs and obligations are measured and reported and out of this external financial report. So this just reiterates GASB is only talking about the numbers that have to be reported in the financial statement. It has nothing to do with what you're required to pay to the capital agency or other pension agency. Uh, the statements do not address how governments approach pension plan funding. A government's policy regarding how much money it will contribute to its pension plan each year. So this is kind of what Jack's talking about. We need to be aware of what and how what changes the city and county governments are making on their policies of how they're funding these pension plans. Are they using these GASB, these new GASB numbers? to increase their funding, their policies of funding these pension plans and therefore overfunding pensions. Uh, 
or are they continuing to pay the amount required by CalPERS? And so we, we need to make sure we're clear on what their policies are and how much they actually are paying it. Um, while there has been a close relationship between how governments fund pensions and how they account for and report information about them until now, this guidance establishes a decided shift from the funding based approach to an accounting based approach. And this is gathering recognizing in the past what you paid, what CalPERS, what the pension agency reported, was exactly the same as what the financial statements reported. Yeah, you now clearly see what you're reporting on your financial statements is different, and it's going to be different than what you're paying and what's required to be made. Uh, the part the body crafted in this brief statement is the fundamental belief that funding is squarely a policy decision for elected officials to make as part of the government budget approval process. And this is important. It's just kind of reiterating that. that GASB is not saying this is how much you need to pay your pension. GASB is not saying if you pay this much, you're going to be able to meet all of your future obligations. They're not saying anything about what you need to pay. They're saying that you're not going to report. And so it's very important to have, be able to distinguish between those two. And that if any, there are any changes, it's the, it's the policy decision being made by your state and local government. Not the ads you come in and say, you now need to pay the entire amount. So one of the challenges this creates at the table is that you're going to have some employers who think that what GASB is saying is a better policy and they should have to follow GASB because it's GASB, right? But that doesn't really work well with the CalPERS system or what we do in California. It's useful for GASB's purposes to have the same system across the board. But really, if a city or county is choosing to pay more because GASB is saying more, they're just giving CalPERS money they're not asking for. Um, and there's with a, you know, with a system like we have in California where a separate agency, not the employer, is actually paying the pension, the local cities and counties have to ask, does it really make sense for us to be giving someone else more of this money uh, than even they say they need? Um, I think that most cities and counties, when they reflect on that in a sober and conscious way, are going to say, we don't need to give CalPERS more money than they say they need. Um, but ultimately, that's a choice they have to make. And we want to be involved in what choice they make at the local level. But the threshold thing is they got to understand it's a choice and that a lot of people are going to choose not to pay CalPERS more money than they ask for. They don't have any legal obligation to do it, and CalPERS says it doesn't need that much more money. The other issue that you have to look out for is the political aspect of it, where the agencies may use the GAFB number as sort of a sticker shock value to the public in order to exaggerate or inflate what their pension obligations are when, in fact, um, if you're a CalPERS agency, CalPERS determines what the amount that has to be paid is and uh, say it's inconceivable that an agency would pay anything um, above what CalPERS says is due and owed in order to fund those benefits. But for an unsavvy public, you could very easily see political leaders coming and using the GASBY number to have this gigantic amount that they claim that they owe and use that as just an overall pushback on employee compensation and benefits. Definitely. So one of the other challenges uh, that this presents at the bargaining table is the false appearance of financial weakness. Gadsby said it really clear. Take this quote, write it down, remember to use it when you get this pitch at the bargaining table. Gadsby clearly states, well, this information will, in some cases, give the appearance that a government is financially weaker than it was previously. The financial reality of the government situation will not have changed. And that makes sense, again, right, because the amount they have to pay for the pensions is different than what they have to report under GASB 68. So if you look at GASB 68 and you think, oh, that reported information, that's what they have to pay, I think, oh my gosh, they have to pay so much more than they have to. But they only have to pay as much as CalPERS or that 37 Act is asking them for. Um, and that number is likely to be lower. So don't let them tell you their financial situation is weaker. You know, take what GASB says itself and push it back at them. Yes, you're saying that this doesn't change the financial reality. Um, don't let them confuse you. One of the ways to punch through this um, is to make MMPA 
uh, information requests at the table. And um, best to do it in writing and, and renew it if they don't give you the information you want. And that empowers you um, to force them to give you the information about what they're really paying as opposed to just what they're reporting. And it gives you some remedies if they don't actually do that or if they give you information that's incorrect. A third challenge at the table is how this creates a perfect storm with PEPRA. So I think everyone knows that uh, the governor signed pension reform in September. And one of the things, I mean, it does many things, but one of the things that that pension reform does is it creates a new lower tier, um, this 2.7 at 57 tier. It creates across the board, right, um, for all new hires starting January 1st, 2013. Now, the actual amount of money that has to be paid on those contributions is likely to be a little bit lower because the pension benefit is lower. Um, as a result, all the numbers are going to change anyway, and that's on the um, actual cost side, right? So you've got changes on the actual cost side at the same time that people are starting to use these GASB 68 rules that are going to change what's reported. And what you've got to be able to do at the table is break those two things apart. What you're going to get in a lot of places from employers, this is how much it's going to cost us for our pensions this year. And they're either not going to know or they're not going to tell you um, how much of that is due to the Pension Reform Act and how much of that is really just reported information for GASB. You want to be able to get into those details and break those pieces apart. Um, this is a whole lot that's being put on the shoulders of your in-house financial people at cities and counties at the same time. You know, the system that they've been using for 10 years is changing in a lot of big ways. And some people won't be quite up to speed or some people are going to make mistakes. Or some people are going to move the uh, pieces around a little bit in a way that's confusing. So it's important to see the moving pieces, understand the different components, be able to break through and get down to what really matters and what's really going on. So Jeff, let me ask you a practical question at the bargaining table. Do you foresee these new GASB rules putting additional pressure on agencies or maybe giving momentum to agencies that were already predisposed to push below the PEPRA formula, the 2.7 at 57 for safety? Definitely. So, um, you know, because you've got this new automatic tier that's coming in, there's going to be pressure in some agencies to go even lower, right? Um, especially if, let's say, you were a 3 of 55, right? So now you're being pushed to the new highest tier, which is 2.7 to 57. Maybe you, as a city manager or county executive, think, well, let's go a tier lower, because we were always a tier lower. Um, and a lot of people who see this as a golden opportunity to eviscerate pensions want to take your pension benefit down as low as they can, especially for new hires. Um, because you can no longer protect new hires, keep them at 3 at 50, they're going to take a hit anyway. They see an opportunity to do that. So they come in with the GASB 68 report and stuff and say, look at how much more expensive this is. And I can totally see how this is going to play out. Some places can say it like this. You take your GASB 68 numbers and your new 2.7 at 57, and you come to the table or you tell your council or you tell the public, this 2.7 at 57 is actually going to cost more than 350 cost us. Um, and so we need to go even lower to make it even. Even if they're not really paying the GASB 68 numbers, they're just reporting it. So you can kind of see how that'll be used as leverage. I think the key is to get in early before the, um, your uh, city and county executives dig themselves a hole, it's harder to get out of. Um, make sure that council's getting accurate information quickly. Um, make sure the public isn't getting this information and if they are, it's being corrected quickly. Um, because you have two problems. Like we said before, you got some um, local government leaders who aren't going to quite get it um, and see a lot of those problems we saw with the last GASB change where they think it means something it doesn't mean. And so they're going to tell people what they think it means. Um, and they don't want to have to come back later and say, oh, gee, I was wrong. And then you're going to have people who are going to see how far they can push it and push you. And if they can get away with pitching a certain version of events that's different than you know, the nuts and bolts of what's really going on, um, they're going to push that as far as they can get it. If they get away with it for a while, um, they're going to convince a lot of decision makers that something's true that isn't. So um, don't let them come at you and say or put, put out to the public or, um, you know, convince the council that their financial situation is a lot weaker than it is or that um, PEPRA is creating 
a need for a new lower pension tier. You've got to break the pieces apart, demystify it a little bit, um, and ultimately it comes down to that policy decision. Cities and counties should ask themselves, why should we pay more to CalPERS than CalPERS is asking us for? It's critical to understand this difference, and I know we keep harping on it, between what is reported and what is required. Because, as I'm sure everyone knows, PEPRA, as dramatic as the drop to 2.7 to 57 was, that's not the floor. PEPRA specifically allows for lower benefit formulas, and there's still a lot of folks out there, both uh, in the management side and citizen groups within the public, that are pushing for even more draconian cuts in pensions for new employees and also for current employees uh, pushing down to the 401k or hybrid plans. There's a lot of folks out there that want to challenge the last 50 years of precedent that holds that pension benefits are vested and go after them. And these new GASB reporting requirements are a potential threat in that when misused and misconstrued, they can be used to generate some political momentum to take another round of attack at public employee pensions. And on Jeff's point of why we you take you know, CalPERS more than they ask for, we're going to talk about that later. And, and there's a couple areas that the citizen parties might use of why they might make a policy decision to actually pay more you know, for the pensions. And so we'll look at that. Great. Um, so, with the kind of, you know, what we've talked about so far is what GASB is, what this rule is, how that all plays in to how pension accounting works, and the big challenges you're going to see at the table. So, with that in light, we want to kind of get into GASB 68, this treatise that they put out, um, and uh, talk about how the mechanics work so that you can have a working knowledge of it and fight back when people say it means things it doesn't mean. So, Shailene, can you tell us a little bit more about net, net pension liability? Yeah, thank you. So now we're going to get kind of into the accounting and so that's in both of this. Um, so hopefully I'll put you guys to sleep with all the, the accounting information. Um, the net pension liability, that's a, that's a big thing. And that's what's going to be required to be reported on your financial statement, on your balance sheet, on the city and county balance sheet. It was never reported there before. This is a big number that's going to come in, it's going to go on the balance sheet, but it's never there. Historically, the only, so historically the way things were done was, let's say, and you count the as an example, how there comes out and says, you owe a million dollars for your annual required contribution this year. The main county only pays 800000 So that $200,000 difference was the liability that the city and county still owe the CalPERS, and that amount would be reported onto the financial statement. In California, though, you're required to pay your annual required contribution. You're required to pay that million dollars. So we never saw really any of that. There was never any liability as reported on the financial statements or on the city and county financial statements before. Um, so now we're going from a zero number to a big number that's going to come out. And let's get a little bit more into what is this pension liability and how it's going to change. There's really two ways or two types of changes that are happening to this net pension liability under GASB. Uh, again, I'm going to reiterate this a hundred times how pension plans are calculated in that pension liability is still the same. This GASB doesn't affect that. They could in the future we can possibly make changes to get more in line with GASB. But as of right now, we're only talking about changes in the numbers to report on financial statements, not have curves or other pension agencies report and calculate them. The two areas that we're going to talk about for your pension liability are valuing the assets, how your assets are valued, as well as changing the discount rates. So let's get into valuing those assets. Um, and again, a lot of this I hope it up for you guys, but Historically, pension funds typically use the actuarial value of assets. And one of the big parts of this type of valuation is that it includes smoothing the gains and losses over time. Um, and this is how Paris does it and most of the pension agencies did it. 
or and continue to do it. And what about that snooping is really important because as we all know, there's the stock market fluctuation day to day. It can be it goes up, it goes down, but it's highly volatile. It, it changes dramatically over time it, it, and it blinks an eye. And so what this smoothing does is it comes in and it takes all those gains and losses. It smooths out over time. So the value of those assets stays pretty consistent. So it goes up, you know, consistently, and it goes down. You don't see these huge spikes, these huge volatile value of assets. And so you can use it more as an indication of what that value is. What Gadsby's now saying is no. Now you have to use the market value of assets. And that market value is based on the stock market at a single point in time. So the value of your asset, which as we know, is what is your your net pension liability is the liability minus the asset, which is your net pension liability. So the value of this asset under Gadsby is subject to the fluctuations of the stock market. So if it you know, I take you with example, but so it's September 1st, 2001. Your assets are up here. After 9-11, the value of your assets are down here. Huge dramatic changes. But under that, you are stuck with that really little rock on the house. And we all know in today's uh, stock market environment, the fluctuations are huge. huge we're seeing. Well, as an example, didn't CalPERS numbers, they went down dramatically. They went down like a third or something during the, the Great Recession. But they came up again like 25% over two years. Right. They just bounced. Mm -hmm. But it's a smooth. It's not on a day-to-day -day fluctuation. And so what that's been saying is with these market value assets, it's going to change like this, that bouncing from day to day versus over a three year, five year smoothing time of them bouncing back or a decreasing. And so, depending on what day you choose to value these assets, it's going to make a huge effect on what your value is, what the number is, and what your value is. Um, so, how does that affect the predictability? There is no predictability. It's going to change. And, and it's not going to be consistent. Um, it's going to be hard for the city and county to, to plan and the budget. You, you're going to have these numbers, but it can be all over the board in theory. Um, and then there is no predictability. I mean, the stock market is not predictable. We could predict the stock market, we're all quite rich. But um, that, that's one of the big differences that we're going to be seeing. And CalPERS is still going to be using this movie method. So they're going to come out and say, okay, you know, here's your value asset, you know, come up a little bit, come down a little bit, you know, what have you. Whereas that is, it's anybody's guess of what they, they choose to do at that point in time. So being an optimist, when the stock market does come back, is that going to make these pensions look super funded? I don't think that we're going to be looking super funded for a while. <laughs> with the, uh, the stock market coming back, but it, it could go, you, you know, again, it could be up and then you have a political change that was just going to and the, the stock market crashes and it goes down. So you're, you're subject to all those outside influences. So it is, yeah. They really try to, uh, what's the word? You know, that they balance that before. That you're not subject to all of those outside economic forces that are going on. So it injects volatility back into the accounting that CalPERS, over a number of years, has perfected smoothing and avoiding. Yes. Absolutely. There's going to be a ton of volatility in all of them. So that's a big change in value of the assets, and it, it's going to be significant. So we could have our these numbers reported on an individual city or county's balance sheet change 10 or 20 percent year to year? Yes. Wow. I mean, it's very you just have to date that, and that's the that's the big thing. It's, it's a day to day change, and every day you look at the stock market. So, so um, let's say I'm I'm a cunning and clever city manager, and uh, I have my accountants run the numbers based off of things today because the stock market just took a dip. I could come into the first day of bargaining and say, well, if we run the the accounting numbers today, this is what the number is, guys, so I'm going to need a lot of money out of you. And by the time I'm done with bargaining, if it's popped back up, it could be very different. Yeah, very. Oh. I don't know if that will actually, but in theory, that could happen. So it seems to me that that key piece of information is 
an important tool for labor leaders to recognize in challenging the long-term reliability of these CASB reporting requirements. Absolutely. It's a volatile, inconsistent number. Um, and that's why most companies have always used the actuarial evaluation approach that uses the smoothing to take away all of that inconsistency and that volatility of it um, that's now going to be back in. And so we need to be aware of that table. Mm -hmm. The next big piece that we're going to talk about um, is discount rates. And just to give a little bit of history, uh, discount rate basically the higher the discount rate, the lower the liability. So from a standpoint, if you want your liability to be as low as possible, you want it to, to, to use the highest discount rate possible. Um, we don't want to do a discount rate for down, then your liability is going to go up. Um, and just a little bit of background, your discount rate is what is used to project out all of your future liabilities and then discount it back to today. And discount rate in theory is what you expect to earn on your assets and your investments and your liabilities, but you expect to earn on those investments in the future to be able to pay those future liabilities. Um, we all know, I'm sure we all know, CalPERS changed their discount rate from 7.5 to 7.5%. It was a big deal, big talk. Oh my gosh, I really didn't go up, you know, attention to the is going up, and, um, because of that discount rate goes down, your liability is going to go up. So they went from 7.5 7 to 7.5%. GASB has now come out and said, okay, we're now requiring you to use two different discount rates. They take the lot of future liability and they break it up into two different pools. One set of liabilities is completely unfunded. There's no assets sitting underneath those liabilities to pay those future liabilities. They're unfunded liabilities. And now we said to those unfunded liabilities that you have, you have to use a risk rate. rate. Um, it's typically set at a 20 year municipal bond rate. And it runs about 3 to 4% right now. So you have to use discount rate 3 to 4%, just so say 3.5% on the left side of my way, where CalPERS and these other agencies are using a discount rate of 7.5%. That's huge. We saw a huge change between 7.75 and 7.5. Now we're going to go from 7.5 to 3.4 or 3.5%. To drive that home, to drive that home, when you lower the discount rate, you increase the liability, as Shane said. How does that affect you and getting beyond all the numbers on it on a practical level? That means a greater contribution is required in order to fund the plan. Right. So you're looking at increased demands for employee cost shares, increased uh, demands or liabilities on your employers, which is going to put downward pressure on overall employee compensation and benefits. Right. In theory, yes, but because these are gathering reported numbers and these are not your actual numbers that are being funded under the plan, it's not your actual liability that's out there being paid by your pension plan, the, the, the people, the city of the county are going to say, look, you know, we need a lot more money to be able to fund this liability because this liability is huge. Our pension is going to be great. But, but no, because we know, we're educated, we're, we're here. We know that what you're actually going to pay into the pension plan, into CalPERS, has nothing to do with this completely overinflated liability because it decreased the pension of the discount rate so much. I'll say just, you know, someone who's been following this for a couple of years, I think 3 to 4 percent as a projected future return for CalPERS seems absurd. Absolutely. I mean, their, their 20 year average, past 20 years, is 8 percent. They, they did have a couple bad years in the recession where they lost and then they had a very slight increase, but then they had like a 20% increase in assets. And if you just, if you look at how much they have um, made on their investment returns in the long term, it's more than twice this amount. Mm -hmm. And what Gadley's saying is that these are your unfunded liabilities, so they, they don't have investments sitting underneath these liabilities, so the liabilities are very risky. You don't have assets sitting under the liability. So they're riskier, so you don't know what kind of return you're going to get. Even though CalPERS is proven over and over, the kind of returns we're going to get historically. Um, 
Gatsby does allow you, so they break it up into two pools. Your, your unfunded liability at three and a half to three to four percent right now. Um, and the other pool is your liabilities that do have access to the aggregator. They have investments set aside to pay those liabilities. And so for all of the liabilities that have investments set aside, you can use an investment return that is expected. In this case, probably the CalPERS return is to 78%. So at the end of the day, what guys do is come out and you're basically, you're going to have a blended discount rate. So your liabilities are going to be at 3.5%, which is going to change over, you know, year to year. And some of your liabilities will be at 78%. So depending on how much investment, how much money you have put into your pension fund, depends, will depend on which discount rate you need to use. So the more money that you have put and funded into the pension plan, you can use the higher, the more you can use the higher discount rate, which drives your total blended rate up and makes your pension liability decrease. And then this is really confusing. But this is where it kind of gets into just point of why will it in county pay more than what CalPERS is asking for? Well, this is why. So this is what political pressure to pre fund. Yes. So that you would but at the end of the day, yes, yeah, it makes your financial statement look better because you not only have your investment thrown in there and it's decreasing the liability, but then you get to use a higher discount rate. So you're doubling your work. And so driving that liability down twice as much, twice as much, but not too high, but it's doubling rewarding and prefunding your pension plan. So you need a higher discount rate, which drives your liability down. And then you have more assets sitting in there. So your net pension liability, liability minus assets equals your net pension liability, is low because you have more assets. But at the end of the day, the reward you get for doing that, the pat on the back you get to give yourself, is some number on a piece of paper that is unrelated to how much you actually have to pay. But from a city and county point of view, that number on a piece of paper is what they're striving for. That number is what's affecting their bond rate. That number is affecting their ability to, to get finance and their ability to go out to the public and say, look at us, you know, we're at 70 percent funded, you know, we're well off, you know, we're not in public. I think you also have to look at the political side of this, which is the pressure that these GASB reporting requirements are going to put on your local pension boards and even statewide with CalPERS. We saw this play out with the reduction that Shailene mentioned of the discount rate from seven and three quarters to seven and a half. And everybody saw the dramatic increase that just that small quarter of a percent reduction in the discount rate ended up causing on the amount of contributions that were required from the agencies and ultimately the employees. And so while these new lower discount rates aren't mandated, what I'm concerned about is the pressure that that's going to put on CalPERS to go reassess the discount rate that it uses. And while CalPERS is a big agency and they and have an ability to push back, you have to look at also your local pension funds um, in the 37 Act and in the other uh, Los Angeles uh, San Francisco, those types of areas where you're going to have a great deal of political pressure to come back and reassess and use a discount rate that more closely resembles the Gatsby rate. And then it no longer becomes just a theoretical reporting that can be used to scare people at the bargaining table and, and to get momentum on uh, depressing wages and benefits, it will have a great real consequence because it will increase the amount that is required to be contributed, which will ultimately lead to additional pressures for greater employee contributions and reductions in paid benefits. And, and we're running I think, pretty short on time here, so I'm going to rise with this stuff really quick. Um, the next slide on the discount rate, these are just some quotes. I, I would read them and use them at the bargaining table. These are coming from the Association of State Budget Officers. So there's people in there that are creating these budgets that are sitting at the table across from us. 
Um, and it talks about how they are incentivized to pre-fund these pension plans because you get this, this kind of general reward. Um, and if you don't pre-fund, then you're being penalized for having to use this lower discount rate. Um, we, we were talking a lot about funding status. I want to hit on that really quick. And because that is what really does drive a lot of your, your bond ratings and that type of thing, um, what's going out to the public. And 70 is adequate, 80% funding status is it, healthy, under 60% is considered weak. So where are we today? Um, in a presentation that came out by CalPERS, the 2010 funding status for safety was at 65%. So that's already been sitting there right between weak and adequate. Uh, the 2011 is expected to come out higher at 73 to 74 because they have a pretty good year of returns, 21% of investment returns. So it's right into the, so CalPERS in 2011, it's interesting, is going to be sitting as adequately funded. Um, but with these new Gatsby rules coming out, the funding status that the, the cities and counties are going to be reporting is going to be significantly lower. There was uh, an article that came out that said uh, that pension plans in 2010 that were funded at 77 percent would drop to 53 percent using this lower discount rate. Uh, a lot of numbers haven't been run. We don't know exactly what we the funding status is going to be, and obviously it's going to change between each city and county. But going from a 77 percent, which is almost strong funding status, is considerably weak funding status, and that's what's going to hit home. Of these cities and counties at the table saying, hey, we're broke. We're insolvent. Look at our funding and look at the pension plan. It's completely insolvent. And if they have to pay everything themselves, that'd be different. But they just have to pay CalPERS. Right. CalPERS are sitting out. there saying, oh no, we're 73% funded. For the cities and counties, they're reporting 53% funded. So that just kind of hammers home how big these numbers and these differences. Of, are going to be between what CalPERS is reporting and what the city and county is reporting to the exact same pension plan. So just to, to clarify for those watching, we're going to have competing funding ratios. One, Absolutely. Will, one will be reported in the CAPR. That will be much lower than if you're a PERS agency, what PERS reports? Yes. And so how does anybody figure out which one to call? What everyone's concerned is about. And that's the bottom line that the city and county are going to be using. Let's work with the papers not come to the summit, really. Well, CalPERS for the exact same plan is sitting at 70 years So let's take the reverse bet. You get a two year county that uses the Gatsby numbers, makes it look like they need all this money. They get all this money for a couple of years, one way or another. They put it in the fund. The Gatsby rules say they're 70% funded. Look, under the CalPERS calculation, it could be 100% funded or more than 100% funded. Mm -hmm. They're going to be in the fund. You're back to the 90s in the super funding. Yeah, but, but CalPERS has, uh, in the past 80 years, they've gone from 55% to 138% funding. Over 80 years, at different points in time. So we could, you know, if you had a little bit of funding and pension, you could see turns down the window and that. But over 100% funding status. And that's risk moving, so the volatility that you talked about before in the stock market is going to have dramatic effects here, correct? So the gas numbers. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we also have the pension expense. Basically, the pension expense, what you need to know about this is the, the pension expense historically what was reported on your income statement as your expense was what you take. It was your annual required contribution that was given to you by the pension plan. It's the amount that was paid. Now, as we come out and say, oh, no, 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 your pension expense has to be calculated to the extremely complicated calculation of all kinds of assumptions and changes. And, uh, and it's really, the bottom line is that it's driven off of the change of the, the pension liability versus the actual amount paid. So no matter what, the pension expense, the bottom line is the pension expense, the city is never going to equal the check that is written by the city and county. So the city and county writes a check for a million dollars, but your gas calculation comes in as a much different number because mm -hmm. it's driven off of the changes of the liability, not what it actually takes, not what the actual check is written in. And that's what you need to be aware of. We need to know, ask at the table, what would actually take. Don't tell me what your gas calculation was, but it has all these different assumptions and different. Uh, Changes in what 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 was the check? What came out of our general fund? That 
what's the normal flat to financial situation. Gotcha. Not what this number is. And just as a housekeeping note, I know we're closing in on the one hour, but we really have no time limitations here. We have a few more slides that we're going to finish up, and we'll stick around. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and submit them through the website, and we'll try to answer any questions that we get. Yeah, well, I called the office, and I'm glad to be able to help or talk to any of you guys out there that have some more information and need some more explanation on stuff, because it is confusing. Kind of Why don't we finish up on the last couple of slides, Shannon? So your, your pension expense changes, like I said, it's gonna, if your pension expense under GASB is driven by the change of the pension liability. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to be highly volatile from year to year. And the longer we're going to see that, that nice little pension expense that we see from coming out, it, it can be up, it can be down, it's going to be all over the board. As we know, your pension liability is going to be volatile because it's how it's been valued now based on the stock market. And so those changes in your pension liability are going to make the change in your pension expense to put it all the board. So, so I don't even understand how, how, do how do you plan for that? It's going to be very difficult. Well, I think the it's easier easy. solution for a city or county is to plan based off of what CalPERS says they want. But you can't do that. You have to follow the average. Well, you have to report it. Right. You don't have to pay it. It's absolutely. And that's the big thing. Um, but the not going to be reported is going to be highly local. It's going to change from year to year. And it's going to be higher. Um, they're accelerating the pension expense recognition. And that is a known. Gabby clearly states it. Um, it will have the overall effect that the expense recognition needs to be accelerated. So do you see this as just being that most agencies will continue paying what CalPERS or the pension board requires and this information is going to be relegated to the uh, comprehensive financial statement? I don't, well, I, I don't know about that because it gets back into that free timing that we just talked about of the reward of really getting that pension liability down. Of free funding, we, we saw some of that uh, under Gabby 45 with the OPEP. That you know, a lot of cities and counties did pay to go, you know, there's a lower amount. The OPEP comes out and says, Here's the name of the contribution, da, 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 and under Gabby 45. So then a lot of cities and counties go to paying their annual required contribution. They could still make the policy decision to pay the pay to go. But they are changing their policy to meet those annual required contributions on the GAP 45. Is that same thing going to happen here? I don't know. It mm -hmm. could. And that's why it's important to have this information because that you know required contribution is really a misnomer. It's a required number that has to be reported on the financial statement. And just as in GAP 45, most agencies have continued to pay as they go, or if they can, uh, put a little bit away in pre-funding. Same is true here. The regulations and the accounting practices don't change what has to actually be funded. And particularly during the bad economy, it's not the time to be doing pre funding or putting additional revenues aside when cities and counties are struggling to provide their citizens court services. Uh, and at the top of those lists are obviously public safety. Cities and counties should be paying what they need to pay, not putting themselves in a position to get a better interest rate on a new loan for a new, you know, sports center. Mm -hmm. but that's what, you know, so that's what we need to be educated. We need to know it, it's just so important that when you're at the table, be educated, have someone there that understands this stuff right now because I mean, counties that don't understand this stuff right now. So things are going to be laid up. People are going to be laid off kinds of things. Yeah. And so it's really important to have the facts and have the understanding. Um, and because we could be seeing policy changes on the city and county. We could in the future be seeing policy changes on hurt to start hearing more of this gap of information. Um, so those are really some of the important points you need to be watching out for and you need to prepare for. Um, a couple other items. The, um, if you are a member of a cost sharing pool, 
plan, so your city or county is part of a, a bigger plan at CalPERS, you're going to be required to report a proportionate share of that plan. Now, so it's that, that's practical matter, how do you do that? you got to have CalPERS do it, don't you? Well, the, the interesting part is that we have this here on how you do all these calculations, how, how you have to what discount rates you have to use, and they're very specific on so much stuff. But this is one area that they are not specific on, they are not clear on of how to calculate that question of share. So here in CalPERS, if someone's going to be doing the calculation on that huge pool, and then somehow proportionately breaking out what that small city or county piece of that pool is. And it's not clear on how that's going to be done. That would be an interesting adventure. Um, again, we talked about there's very significant increases in changes in the note disclosures that we're going to see in financial statements in the CAFR. It's not a bad thing to get the information. Um, they're going to look back 10 years. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information that doesn't reflect really the reporting or the, the funding. Um, it is just for informational purposes. And um, you know, probably a lot of people won't see that. I'll read them, um, but probably a lot of other people won't. The other big thing is the cost of compliance of what the people do. And right now, in the economy, the city is having to grow. You know, every dollar counts, so they say. Um, in the past, as we know, CalPERS, the agency, pension agency, would put out an evaluation report every two years. In that report, it had all of the information that the city and county needed to meet their reporting requirements. It had the calculation of expense, it had the, the liabilities, whatever. It had everything that they needed to meet the reporting requirements. Now, because that was required a completely different set of numbers to be calculated, the CalPERS evaluation report doesn't meet the requirements at all. It doesn't feel the right numbers because it's calculated completely different than how it has always been. So the cities and counties are going to have to go out and hire an actuarial outside and have a report done. And so it's going to be an additional cost to all these cities and counties. And I know CalPERS has come out and said that they will, they're going to be able to do these calculations but you're going to have to charge the cities and counties for them because it's not something they do for themselves mm -hmm. and they can just hand over the report. It's a whole new set of calculations and a whole new report. So it's going to be costing the city and county more money. Gotcha. All right. Well, just to kind of recap, um, you know, we've talked about a bunch of things about this GASB 68. We started talking about um, what GASB is and um, that GASB 68 is a a standard that they put out. It's not mandatory, but a lot of people are going to start looking at it because it affects how banks and bondholders look at these cities and counties when they want to lend their money. Uh, David gave a little overview about how pension accounting works to get us into uh, the, the changes that 68 causes. We talked about the challenges at the table. Um, the challenges between what's reported and what's funded. The challenges about um, uh, how this is going to make some cities and counties look financially weaker and the challenges this is going to present given the Pension Reform Act. And uh, then we broke down uh, the nuts and bolts of 68, we talked about uh, net pension liability and we talked about uh, pension expense and what those things mean and how to break them apart and get a better understanding of where you're at given the is that these are non-mandatory uh, rules and it has nothing to do with how much they have to pay for these pensions. It just has to do with what they have to put on a fancy little report um, that, you know, the accountants are going to read and um, it's going to matter, but not nearly as much as some people will think. So we hope that this has helped to demystify this rule a little bit, giving you some tools, some of those quotes from GASB uh, to take with you into contract negotiations and underscore the importance of having a forensic accounting expert um, at the table or accessible as part of your uh, plan for contract negotiations. We're going to stick around um, and answer some questions online, but that's the end of our presentation. We're going to shut off the video. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Okay.